Welcome to Lectionary Call-In for Tuesday, July 12th of 2022, where two laypersons, a pastor, and an academician gather for about 45 minutes each week to discuss the Gospel Lectionary for the coming Sunday. This Sunday is July 17th, and each Tuesday we call in from wherever we may be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and for our friend Charles Willard in Central Time, it's 5.30 a.m. Our little team's working to be faithful to Lectionary Year C, and that puts us in the Gospel of Luke in the 10th chapter on Sunday, and we hope this discussion will provide areas of focus and reflection. We develop perspectives independently after the leadoff person shares some formative questions, and then in this virtual discussion room, we share, encourage, and challenge each other. And here are the folks joining us in today's discussion. Bill Hall, St. Petersburg, Florida. Charles Willard. St. <laughs> Sorry. It's in Minnesota. <laughs> it is a saint. Sarah Mickelson in Tampa. And I'm Don Upton in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Sarah Mickelson is our lead today, and we're, we're looking forward to her reading and her questions. Hello, Sarah. How are you doing? Good morning, everybody. I am well. And it's only 81 in Tampa. Yay! <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good temperature for this time of year. Um, we're looking at Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And this is a familiar, like old pair of blue jeans familiar story. Um, and I'm going to start in verse 38. Um, now, as they went on their way, he, Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Okay. Dog found a box. Box fell. Um, That ends the reading of our scripture. I have three questions. So, based on this text, what seems most important to each person in this story? And how does that inform how we follow? My second question is, what message or messages do you hear in this exchange between Christ and Martha? And my third question, with a nod to William Wordsworth, what do you do when the world is too much with you? How do you address your inner Martha or Martha and hold the balance between action and worship? Going back to question one, based on this text, what seems most important to each person in this story, and how does that inform how we follow? How about, Bill, I'll go to you. Thank you. Good morning, team and others listening in, viewing. Um, There, of course, seem to be three Actors. One is Mary, who is silent uh, and seems eager to hear and learn. Um, And I would insert that we need not assume that she would not do her part later with the household chores, whatever it is that Martha wants help with. Um, Martha, one could take this to mean that she is focused on her role in society as a woman. She's supposed to be the hostess. She's the one who welcomes Jesus into the home. She seems irritated, feels neglected. And Jesus is present here, having set his face to go to Jerusalem. Uh, I noted earlier, Sarah, uh, an interesting issue, and I won't dwell here long, The text literally says she invited him into the house, 
the New Revised Standard Version says into her house, and some commentators take that to be the case. Others challenge that. Again, I won't park there, but just an interesting point of the literal Greek text. Um, to quote a minister uh, whose article I read, a Mark Walker, a <clears throat> Nazarene pastor, he says, in the story of the Good Samaritan, which was um, recent, we see that the disciples are called to go and do. In the story of Martha and Mary, we see that disciples are called to sit and listen. Uh, that would be a part of my takeaway. It doesn't have to be everyone's. Um, I you you ask um, how does the priorities of people inform how we will follow. And I, I, this is an affirmation. I think your questions somewhat blend together. So there are some things I will say later that perhaps speak to, to question one. But um, for me, as a person who likes to be action-oriented, I have discovered previously and continue to discover the both and. <laughs> Sarah, there's my both and. I will have, probably have more before this conversation is ended. The, the importance of action, because Jesus certainly calls people to act, but Jesus himself spent time alone in reflection. So um, there is this tension between underworking and overworking. Um, either extreme uh, can uh, lead us astray. Um, so my thought is a work in progress. I'll stop there for a moment, Sarah. Thank you for the question. Charles, what are your thinks? What, what are your thinks about this? <laughs> I'm trying to imagine what Luke uh, was thinking when he consciously, and I say consciously because I think he was aware of what other writers had included and what what he puts down here is not something that shows up in any of the other Gospels. It, it's, 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 it's his, it's his not, I, I wouldn't say his presentation, but it's simply his his take on this particular situation. And in some ways, I'm not sure that Luke gives away. Well, he does and he doesn't. I mean, he, he, we don't, we don't, we don't get the afterplay. We don't get the the, the, the circumstance now. Now that the the, the 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 conversation is completed, the guests are gone away, uh, and Martha and Mary have to work out, you know, what their problem was and who, you know, who made the right decision. And I think over and over again, our uh, ways of listening to these discussions are almost impossible for us to manage. They, I mean, it's not that we don't think we can manage them because each of us has an opinion about what, sh what Martha should have done and what Mary should have done and what Jesus should have done and why it worked out that way. But that's... We're in, in 2022, and it's, it's it's not the same as it was in 30 BC or 30 AD, it, and 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 how and, and and even later, how it was for Luke, who couldn't have been the only one that had access to this story, but was the only one who decided. I want to put it in. It needs to be there. It needs to be seen, heard, and understood, but seen, heard, and understood by those who are aware of the context in which it gets delivered. And it's almost impossible, I think, for us to really understand what that was. Not only were we not there, we don't have the, the, the givens that are not described. There's not a list of do's and don'ts for this kind of occasion for uh, smarty 
21st, 22nd century people trying to think about what this would have been and then and then to think about what does it mean for us. Thank you. Don, do you have any thoughts about this? Well, great question. If folks are facilitating uh, or running some discussion groups this week, don't be afraid of a stage center like this, just to stand back and see what the priorities are. I think it goes a long way to understanding what Luke's trying to put out there uh, and putting a list up on a wall of what we think uh, the, was most important to each person works. Uh, not different than what we do in business and solving problems where, you know, it's that where are you coming from question that really reveals a lot. Uh, this is more public in my reading than I expected before. I, there are a number of people there. We don't know how large. I like to imagine it's a fairly large group of people, and this may be in public, uh, kind of a little trial. Uh, so for for one, I, I think, you know, if I were participating in the list making, I'd say, well, there's an opportunity in her mind uh, to do what's right, be of service, to provide excellence, um, to, to manage whatever system is in place uh, to meet expectations. Uh, if, if she is a host, to be a welcoming host, uh, to have the right approach. And that goes to role play. Uh, not necessarily the roles that we would just lead to, and like Charles is saying, we we don't we can't make assumptions about the roles, but there are roles that make things work. And so, in service, uh, there is there's good work to be done. As for uh, one sitting at Christ's feet, the pr the priority is proximity, uh, and it's it's a home, it's domestic, and proximity still matters. Um, maybe. Instead of being uh, a few meters away, just right there, listening, peace, no alternative system at all. And I, something I haven't thought about, Sarah, until this time is an aware awareness of dropping an obligation. Does she know that she's not doing what would be expected by sitting at Jesus' feet? And I, I think that makes it a more powerful setting that she's aware that she is frustrating a system or not doing what's expected. Uh, and then for Jesus, there is a little public trial going on here. I think, uh, you know, Bill Wallace, who used to teach uh, a lectionary class at Palmas here Presbyterian Church for generations, did point out that he thought that Jesus was pushing boundaries of roles, which may include gender, just like he did with culture. Uh, and and for me, when I look at it, he's pushing the boundaries of tasks and timing in this domestic setting. Uh, and he's made it a staging ground for mercy and grace and learning rather than a staging ground really for hospitality. I mean, he really turns the world on its head in this little space. Um, and I, I think it is a little public trial. And, and the person sitting at his feet is being challenged, prosecuted. Uh, and he is stepping in not as a person, as an independent mediator, but she takes her side. Uh, there's a prosecutor out there, and he says he takes her case and he becomes the intermediary. He becomes the advocate for the best possible behavior. So I love this question. It's just a great state setter. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. You know, it, it struck me that um, for some of us, it's really hard to sit still. For some of us, it's really a challenge to not be doing something all the time. And I think that uh, we already have been given the phrase in Luke that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. So the window of opportunity to hear Jesus and sit at his feet is closing. And and so maybe there's a bit of that in this particular message as well, um, a word of, of, of instruction or love for those of us who have difficulty sitting and doing nothing. 
that that it looks like you're doing nothing, but maybe what you're doing is the right thing because time is short and the person you're with is precious. Um, I think that that's an important note for those of us who um, consider the presence of someone a gift or that maybe we ought to consider the presence of someone a gift when um, instead of a yet another task item, and and we we fail to value the human that's in front of us as highly as we value our list of to dos. Um, and I think that that's another um, in opportunity or invitation for me specifically in this text, um, because it is harder to sit down and have a cup of coffee with someone and do nothing but have conversation if you feel like your priorities need to be somewhere else. So I I think that there are multiple layers to this conversation, um, but that that Mary is, is demonstrating something that's equally difficult, and that's to pay attention right now to who's here and to live in this moment instead of in the moment five minutes from now where everybody's going to be hungry and want refills. That makes sense. So uh, question number two, what message or messages do you hear in this exchange between Christ and Martha? And and I'm going to, I'm going to ask the question, do you suppose that this Mary and Martha are the Mary and Martha with Lazarus Mary and Martha? Question mark. So what do you hear in this exchange between Christ and and Martha? Um, Don, you want to throw anything out? Sure. And I do suppose, if I answer that question, I do. I I, I I choose to believe that. Uh, I, I think there's I want more from the story. In a lot of Luke's stories I I want more. He he settles down he he settles down as an observer and listener the way he writes. And I still don't have enough. So with uh, with one of the characters, I wanna know I think it's not fair. I want I want the list of things to be done. It's the, I don't have the list. What needs to be done? What is the system for the management of this household? How are guests to be treated? I don't think it's fair to her, and I don't think it's fair to me not to have the list of what needs to be done. I think it makes the conflict and what Jesus is being asked to do even more impactful. And maybe it's Luke just not paying enough attention. But I want to know the list because I think it's going to give uh, – the Mary better better standing uh, and Martha better standing if I have both of their lists about what they want to accomplish. I also uh, think that um, the the message that I've, I'm hearing is around the many things, and I want to know the many things uh, because it will help me understand the kind of distractions that Jesus is talking about. I think there's a missing piece in the story. Uh, I think it's easy to cheapen what these distractions are. And I think these distractions are very, very important. And the more important they are, the better we understand the kind of peace and the focus and the one thing that Jesus is talking about. So I'd like to have a little more. Uh, and then sometimes good works can distract from the learning about the kingdom of God. And I picked that up from a sermon uh, about eight years ago when they were on lectionary, that the good works, great works that were intended to manage this household can also distract from the kingdom of God. So whenever two or more are gathered in his name, there is distraction with the best possible intentions. And why this is why Jesus has to come in and defend someone at his feet who's being prosecuted for doing the better thing. Those are my thoughts, Sarah. Hmm. I wonder if not having the list of to-dos gives us the privilege or the burden 
of putting in our own list the things that are triggers for us or are crutches for us. Um, yeah, I, if we did that in a class or something like that, I think I would have to work hard to make sure that they're really, really important. I mean, it's, I think there's a – this is my experience because this – passage is, like you're talking about, the old pair of jeans, like it's over and over again. The more I read it, the more I hear it talked about, the more all the way to the things need to be done are diminished to the point where they seem cheap, and I don't think that's the point. I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, and I'll just say it thoughtfully. If you read Scripture and lead up to this point, What's the one thing we're supposed to be focused on? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength or your spirit, depending on which passage you're reading. And love your neighbor as yourself. There's no word judge in there. There, I think the human expectation is, is a wonderful trap as well as the scaffolding, it could go both ways. It could be a knife, or it could be um, it could be something that is fertilizer that we put on each other that helps us grow. Um, so I, I I live in this tension between wanting. You know, I was I was given that Southern hospitality gene, the one that says the house should be cleaned and all the bathrooms are washed down and the dishes are put in the dishwasher and all the clothing is not put in the oven. It's put away when people come to visit. You have something to offer like pound cake or coffee when they arrive, just in case they need refreshment. Um, you know, you, you sit down, you stop, you have conversation. Those are like hospitality checklists. And if I become fastidious about those, I forget the thing that's most important person sitting in front of me. So... I, I took this to heart, you know, I'm, I tend to be a more of a Martha than a Mary on more occasions than not, and and perhaps that's my flaw, that I become distracted by the activity and I forget, or I, I don't value as highly the moment and the individual in front of me. What are your thoughts, Bill? Um, what message do I hear in this interchange between Christ and Martha? Um, a, a number of things. I'll highlight several that come to mind. Um, it highlights for me again that at times what's most important is being still and being able to be taught, to be still and know. Uh, again, Jesus um, highlights that in his own life by going away to be alone. Uh, he ended up alone in the garden in an agonizing prayer with God. Uh, there are spaces where uh, that is important. Um, I see this... <clears throat> again, as a teachable moment for not only Martha, but assumedly Mary is hearing this, um, an affirmation of her willingness to be still and to listen and learn. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> it, I think it, the message is timeless. We all live with social norms, Um and male and female, um, in any age, the, the society around us sets certain norms, and we embrace some. Uh, sometimes we rebel against them, but those, the power of those norms uh, is there. And for me, it's a reminder that I, our sense of who we are and what our place in the world evolves. I live in a retirement community. One of the interesting frequent subjects of conversation uh, among us 
is how our perception of ourselves changed once we became retired. Um, you know, I was no longer going to the office most days of the week, uh, a schedule, a calendar, uh, a staff to deal with and adapt to and learn from and teach, etc. Uh, now there's, there's less of that. And I have personally enjoyed at least giving myself more freedom to be very selective in where I invest my time. Uh, the other thing I would say is however we define ourselves at any stage in life does not have to dictate in every situation how we act. Let's say for the sake of discussion, Martha is primarily the manager of a house. That's her priority. <clears throat> I don't hear Jesus saying that's bad. He's saying at this moment, what's important is to understand that I am present and I want you to be present with me uh, and to me. You know, we may tend to be a person who takes charge and leads, but there are life situations in which the most caring thing we can do is to be silent and receive another person's story. It's like in the book of Job, his three friends at first do all the right that for seven days and nights they sit with him in his grief and they are silent. Then they start in on him, blaming him and all that sort of thing. They kind of blow it. Um, but um, they were capable of being silent, at least for the seven days. So I hear this story not so much as a criticism of Martha, but an invitation to consider the timing. Right this moment, Martha, What's most important is that you join Mary and others and be present and later take care of the other obligations. Thank you. Charles, do you hear any messages in between this exchange and Martha? <clears throat> no, I don't. I mean, I don't. I guess I should say. I can't imagine that anybody, Martha, uh, Mary, or Jesus would say, all right, now let's step aside for a moment and see what was going on here in the dynamics and then to figure out what really should have happened. I, that's, I just, I can't imagine that happening. I can't imagine that being useful. And, and so I'm, I should keep my mouth shut, shouldn't I? Well, it makes me want to go five years down the path and go, okay, now let's remember this moment. What were we thinking? What, what, what was important? Why, why were we thinking that? So um, I, I think that that's, you're, you're right. Um, in high school, I read a poem by William Wordsworth called The World is Too Much With Us. And this particular passage made me think about that. So with a nod to William Wordsworth, what do you do when the world is too much with you? How do you address your Martha and hold the balance, maybe even hold back the balance a little bit, between action and worship? Um, I think we probably all have had that moment where we've, we have to make decisions and we have to make judgments about what we do with our time since time is fleeting. So how do you address your Martha and hold the balance between action and worship. Charles, do you have any wisdom there for me? <laughs> no. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> what about you, Bill? Um, again, I, I mentioned earlier, Sarah, that and I, this is an affirmation. I think all three questions in some ways um, blend and nurture each other. Um, clearly, hospitality is an important gift in Scripture. Um, but it, this illustrates that any gift is in need of balance based on the circumstances of the moment. Um, 
And Stanley Saunders, a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary, in his commentary on this passage says that this story, quote, juxtaposes equally as important aspects of discipleship, hospitality, listening, and doing, that all of those aspects are important. It's not judging Martha for caring about hospitality. Um, and she's now retired, but um, the head librarian at Columbia Seminary, where I'm, I'm a graduate from there, they have a program, maybe all the seminaries do, that as a graduate, I can call or email the library with books that I see are in their library. If they're available, uh, they will mail them to me for my study. And I utilize it a lot, uh, especially in preparation for the uh, adult faith formation at Palmasia. Um, and the first time I called her, to me, she was the typical librarian, very precise, wanted to know exact information, was very clear about how the process worked. And yet there was a, a gentleness and a softness and an excitement about being able to provide the books at that time that I needed. And right at the end of the conversation, I joked that she was well-named. Her first and middle name are Mary Martha. And I, she said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, you have both. There's the Mary in you, the willing to linger, to listen, and there's the Martha, the, the skilled librarian who's, who's very precise. And she laughed and said she hadn't thought of that. Um, I think there's a Mary and a Martha in each of us, and, and I think that's healthy. Uh, there's however you want to characterize Mary and Martha. We remember that later, uh, at some, I forget the timing, whenever Lazarus died, both sisters, in, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, engage with Jesus in a dialogue about the resurrection. They are both presented as caring, insightful people. So if we look at the rest of the scripture, we see a fuller picture of uh, Martha. Um, and earlier in Luke, the Samaritan village rejected Jesus. There was a lack of hospitality, and now there's a priority by Martha on hospitality, and it reminds us that we have a choice in every situation how we perceive it may be most helpful uh, to act. Um, and it also reminds us that any good gift of God can become an occasion for conflict and competition, reminiscent of the debate at the Last Supper over which disciple was the greatest, which involved male disciples, not at that moment female disciples. Um, and again, I will repeat myself, it reminds us that every moment can be a teaching moment in which we are invited to reflect um, and to discern what we may need to learn at that moment. Again, thanks for the question, Sarah. You're welcome. I'm going to throw out something here. Um, in our house, we have anxiety and panic attacks. Um, and that comes from any number of things. It can be a sequence of behaviors. It can be a sequence of expectations. It can be an overwhelming sense of impossibility. Um, and, and on occasion, we have to talk each other off cliffs, or I should say, into action. And there's a sequence of behaviors that we follow, and it's a grounding exercise that we do with intention to kind of pull us out of the, what I call the future cycle of panic, into the moment of calm that we're in. And so uh, it refocuses the mind away, away from the mental chatter and, and, and that comes with anxiety back into a present moment. And it goes like this. Look around you. Find five things you can see. Find four things you can touch. 
three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And and you can do this with your hand. So it, it starts you off with five, four, three, two, one. But it puts you in a position where you have to a touch, get in touch with specific senses that are observing the immediate proximity of where you are. And we've had to do this laying down on the ground to help with breathing, um, to give everybody a good foothold to um, to stay in this moment. And, and, and when people are experiencing panic attacks, they often feel like they're having a heart attack. And that leads to more anxiety and more panic. And so we have to step backwards and go lay down. Let's go through the five things. And we have a moment and we go, what led to this? So for some of us, when we are confronted with expectations and roles and responsibilities and um, this litany of things that we should do, it can push us into an imbalance, a complete out-of-balance experience. And I think that's what um, an extreme example of, of these things might be, anxiety attacks and, and, and panic attacks. So I, I want to make a note that out-of-balance is not a positive place and that you need to have moments of listening and moments of calm and moments of the present in as much as we do need the list of things that would help us become better followers or more hospitable followers. Um, so I, I kind of want to say there's there needs to be an equal or or a, a, a yin and yang experience, not to lean too much on um, another type of thought, but I think that they can be valuable. And and I forget that sometimes I do need to look around. I need to touch something. I need to hear the person in front of me. I need to smell the coffee, if that's what we're having. I need to um, it, savor the taste of this moment because it is fleeting. So those are all elements that I carry with me. And I think they can be helpful to everybody when we're um, walking this fine line between hospitality and, and, and worship. Don, what do you got? There's a moment before the moment. You both are talking about moments and being in the moment. But at, on a personal level, the moment before the moment is everything. What were you thinking about when you open your eyes? We're all meeting. The sun isn't up wherever we are today when we're meeting. I was thinking about things, and they're much later in the day. And as you were both talking, I realized that my whole mindset, even right now in the middle of a podcast where I need to be paying attention, is based on something that's going to be happening at 2 o'clock today. And the moment before the moment set me. And if that was disrupted, I think I would not be thinking clearly. Or another example would be right now where I'm sitting, I'm in a house on the bottom floor, and there are children in this house who are about to get up. And I'm not thinking clearly because I am preparing, dear listeners, for the disruption of children running up and down the stairs and demanding saying good morning to everybody. Now, who do I think I am? I mean, the children need to be fed, and you may hear them before this podcast is over. But I'm not thinking clearly. It's like a little electrical storm going off. What am I going to do when they start emptying the dishwasher above my head in this room? And so the moment before the moment did that, and I think – we have uh, someone that's running a system here that was thinking about this well in advance before Jesus sat down and people gathered around for him to teach. The disruption began, and there's an electrical storm going off in her head. And so for those of you that have the moment before the moment, it's tough. Or if you're uh, – I moderate a lot of meetings and roundtables, and, you know, when the static goes off, if the agenda veers off and some new idea comes up and I have to discipline myself, that that might be the actual breakthrough. Uh, but before we wrap up, sir, I do want to go back to the poem. You challenged us with the the poem, and thank you. And, and it was the the world is too much with us. And so I I, I want to I want to respond to you putting the poem there, sir. Would you mind if I just read just a few lines of that sonnet? Go right ahead. Okay. So just the front end. 
because l the listeners need, need a reference, but go there, find it. It's easy to find if you go on the Internet. Uh, so the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending. We lay waste our powers. We see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away a sordid boon, the sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, are and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not, great God. And that's halfway through the sign. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful idea, Sarah, to put this beside this scripture. And so I'll, I'm going to go there just a second uh, and say uh, this was written 1,800 years after Christ. We always talk about we're 2,000 years away. How can we know? This is 1,800. Uh, and I think it's filled with alienation because of the distractions of life, especially in the early industrial life. Uh, it's a recognition of this isolation. And it's a signal that humans have the power to experience things. That there's this, my real one is there's a pent up power that we have, which I think Jesus points to as well. Now, these powers can be squandered, spent, wasted, burned up. It's like it's a finite, finite resource, the power to listen, the power to observe, the power to experience the universe. And my reading, my personal reading, also suggests the powers can't be restored, that you have great power, but they're finite, they're expendable, they're connected to the lives of, of what's going on around. They can be exhausted, kind of like at the end of the day. Is Martha exhausted or not? There's also a memory here, this is my last point, that I think there's some gospel and Wordsworth poem, because the, the voice in the poem can't get back to being able to observe. I think he has exhausted his powers, but there's a memory there. How, how does the voice of the poem know that he's alienated and that he squandered his powers? It, it, and the poem that says, it moves us not. But it has in the past. It does. It can. There's, there's a gospel of memory in this poem that says, I'm so distracted and I've exhausted my powers to observe the universe but it's there. It's still, I remember that it was actually possible at some point. So that memory has got some gospel in it, too. So those are my responses to that point. Thanks, Sarah. I agree with you. I mean, we've probably each had a moment where something struck us as so beautiful that we stopped. And we just stood there and looked and went, this is amazing. Whether it was a sunset or Niagara Falls or a great vista on a mountain um, or a long span of, of, of desert to see. I mean, I, I felt that way at the Grand Canyon. Um, you can stop and just go, holy moly, that's incredible. Um, maybe the new photos from the Jack Webb um, telescope will, will strike you that way, or uh, the new discoveries that they're making out of the Great Hadron Collider at CERN um, will strike you that way, but... Um, there's moments given to us each day, if we see them. So that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for playing. Don, back to you. Uh, Don, you. Yes. Don, do you, you mind yes. if I quickly insert something? Yes, sir. Um, I'll be brief. Sarah, back to your illustration about panic attacks. That was very helpful, that strategy for how to get yourself back in the moment. I think to support that, in this passage, there are three very important verbs. Uh, in verse 40, Martha was distracted. In verse 41, Jesus says, you are worried and distracted by many things. Several scholars talk about those three verbs, and collectively, they powerfully present someone captured by something. Yep. Uh, in other words, they are almost enslaved by it. It's very strong language, a kind of panic attack. Um, and I realize we're putting, a, but I think there's a, but as you said that, I thought, wow, you, that, that strategy 
for getting back in the moment uh, and, and perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. It helps our family a lot. <laughs> well, thank you, folks. And, and for uh, folks listening in, thank you for being a part of this today. Palmasia Presbyterian Church is located at 3501 West San Jose Street. Uh, that's in Tampa, Florida. And for more information, you can go to palmasia.org. That's P-A-L-M-A-C-E-I-A.org. We commend that site to you every week for great sermons, discussions, differences of opinion over scripture, prayer, outstanding music, opportunity to take communion. And you're always welcome. We'll see you next time.